checking the audio. Sounds alright, I think. Does it sound low or is that just me? Ooh. What's that? Oh, right off the bat. Thank you, Fox Molder. Is the audio okay for you guys? Audio is low. All right, let me, let me see what I can do about that. Yeti, hello, hello. Hello, 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 hello. Does this work better? Does this work better? Does this work better? Does this work better? I don't know. I can't tell. Does this work better? Or does this work better? Which one? 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 I can't tell. Testing, testing. Testing, listening to myself. Hmm, sounds like shit. Sounds like shit. Let me just check the system preferences. Hmm. Testing, testing. Hello, hello. Oh, that's better. Testing, testing. Hello, hello. Oh, that's better. Yeah, okay. Oh, shit. I should turn that down or something. Let's see. How does that sound? Hello, hello. Oh, that's better. Yeah, okay. Oh, shit. I should turn that down or something. Let's see. How does that sound? Hello, hello. Can you guys hear me? How does that sound? I think it's a little bit better now. I think that's a little bit better. Okay. Nice, we're good. Turn it up just slightly. Is the background noise okay? Nice, we're good. All right, sorry about that. Sorry, sorry. I'm just finish smelling this. How are you guys? I'm sorry about that. Always some bullshit. And in fact, early I didn't get to stream earlier. I wanted to earlier, but um, I my computer the camera wasn't working on any device on any sort of app or anything. 
program. And so I restarted it and it didn't work and I'm like computer retarded. So I tried looking it up and I guess, I mean, the past two years, my computer has been asking me if I want to update every day and I always say no. And so I guess I had to because I updated the computer ran late doing that and now the camera works so yay camera works and then the audio gave me a problem i don't know what's going on it's just fucking up but we are in we're back we yeah the stream through my phone that was annoying um So, um, just gotta show a little bit, guys. Um, I'm doing incredibly badly this month. I really gotta pay rent. And, uh, it would be really great because next week, by the 27th, I am going to see a family member uh, that I haven't seen in a long, long time. Um, just, uh, it's personal, but it's a fucking crazy story. And, um, so... Before I leave, I'm, I'm not going to be able, I don't know if I'm going to be able to stream because where I'm going, I don't know if there's internet, if I can get internet, and if I can, I have to stream off of my laptop, which you guys have seen me a attempt to do with great frustration, and then I have to do it off my phone, and it was this whole thing, ooh, my phone, maybe I can stream off my phone. Yeah, okay, 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 okay. Um, I'll try to do that, and since I won't have my computer, it won't, I won't have, like, OBS, and I can't share my screen, and do all these, like, fancy, you know, change of, uh, cutaways and everything, so, uh, I was like, well, what, how do I do this? How do I stream? And, uh, I have some books, like, I, we went over a little bit, some books, I mean, I have various books, there's alchemy, uh, magic books, so sometimes you guys... I haven't done an alchemy stream in a while, so maybe that'll be fun to bring that back, but we also did, like, one stream about this. Maybe we can bring this back. I do have some real books. And this one's The Philosophies of Beauty. Uh, uh excuse me. The Philosophies of Art and Beauty. Oh, thank you so much, Snowball. Thank you. 25 bucks. Uh, I know YouTube takes their cut, but here's some money. Thank you so much, guys. Uh, yeah. So... Yeah, that would be great. <clears throat> uh, sorry, go back to you guys here. Um, yeah, so I think that'll be great. It's Philosophies of Art and Beauty, Selected Readings and Aesthetics from Plato to Heidegger. It's I know awesome. YouTube takes their cut, but here's some money. Awesome. Amazing, this gift. <laughs> Aw, thank you. It really, really means a lot. So speaking of, I meant to shill. And, uh, yeah, the YouTube always helps because, you know what, the money's money, I'll take it. Uh, but right now I'm doing really poorly uh, this month and uh, I need to pay rent and um, it sucks. My life sucks. And if uh, you want to help me out so that I'm not stressing and I have to, like, ask for borrow money for the first time in my life, uh, you can always help me out uh, by going to this link down here. It's streamlabs.com slash TV. Let me just see if this works too. Okay, this works. And uh, this link down here, streamlabs.com slash Martina Marcota TV. And uh, Streamlabs doesn't take a cut, and then the money goes right into my PayPal right away. So that really helps. I'm just like keeping an eye on my bank account and just like want to get that money transferred in there, make sure I have the rent to pay, clear it, Whew. can like breathe for a few weeks. You know, it's still work. It's still, still streaming all that, but yeah get that done so that helps so thank you trying to do that but what we're going over today is uh medieval early medieval art okay so i already see some mistakes that i made here so up top we have uh, art it's supposed to be art of the west warrior lo lords that sounds fun okay let me see it's very tiny up here on my screen maybe it's better looking at the youtube see <clears throat> art of the warrior lords cool sutton oh god did i really like fuck up all this or is that for real who who shit burial whatever i don't know 
if I wrote any. This all looks like I feel like I'm having a stroke. This all looks weird to me. Haverno Saxon art. This all looks like fucking. I feel like I'm having a stroke. Linda's Farns Gospels. <laughs> like what am I saying? Book of Kells. Carolingian art. Okay, that sounds familiar. Cor Coron Coronation Gospels. Okay, Coronation Gospels. Um, I don't have a stroke on the stream. I feel like I'm having one. I don't know what's going on. Uh, Ebo Gospels. Lin Lindo? Lindo? Lindal? Gospels? Asian? Aiken? Sangal? Corona Gospels. Yeah. <laughs> That's how I was reading it. I'm so used to seeing, like, Corona that I was like, Corona? Coro Corona Nation? Coronation. <laughs> the call and sink all. It's true. Um, and then there are the medieval monasteries, Benedictine rule, Etonian art, Hildesheim, Burnward's doors, and Garrow crucifix. So let's see what we can get through here. Sounds like fun. <laughs> Alright, let me get... I didn't get the book up. Let's get this book up. I am going to my desktop. Then we are going to books. I have a whole folder of books on my computer. Then we have Gardner. Gardner's Art Through the Ages. That's the book we're going over. It's the standard art history textbook uh, at Princeton University. But recently I think they shut down their uh, art history department. Um, I mean course, class, art history, class, not department, and uh, because they said it was focused too much on Western European white art, and uh, here we are to go over this stuff. And speaking of, we just finished Islamic art, and we are now going into the er early medieval art, European art, early medieval Europe. Does Patreon take a part of the money? That's a good question. I don't know. I mean, I think all of the services do as some sort, a very small portion or whatever. I gotta figure out how to turn this off. Okay. All right, Michael McLaughlin. Hey, what's up? I think I have a solution for you and your husband. You both moved to Canada. As a Commonwealth citizen, he gets an automatic visa and you get one as his wife. Uh, Winnipeg is a beautiful city I visited last year. Please think about it. Oh, I will. I think we have considered all that. I cannot imagine permanently moving and residing and having kids in another place other than America. I think I have a solution for you and your husband. You both moved to Canada. As a Commonwealth citizen, he gets an automatic visa, and you get one as his wife. Winnipeg is a beautiful city. I visited last year. Please think about it. Yeah, I'll think about it, and uh, I think we have thought about it. Like I said, I can't imagine permanently residing anywhere outside of um, <clears throat> America, but yeah, think about it. I think it's an injustice if we have to do that. So it's still a, a complaint, <laughs> but yeah, for sure. Thank you. That sounds nice. I've never been to Winnipeg. I've been to some other places, like Toronto or whatever. Yeah. Look somewhere else. Where's the other like hippie kind of city? Is it Toronto? Ontario? I don't know. It's an area. I don't know. I don't understand Canada. All right, so yeah, here we have Gardeners Art Through the Ages, and we are in Chapter Six: Early Medieval and Romanesque Europe. How exciting! By the way, guys, my beverage is, of course, I made a fresh new pot of my I peach iced tea. Mm. Very refreshing. No sugar this time. Um, <clears throat> just want to make sure you can see it. Okay, 
early early medieval and Romanesque Europe. Historians once referred to the thousand years, roughly 400 to 1400, between the uh, dying Roman Empire's official uh, adoption of Christianity and the rebirth, the renaissance, of interest in classical art as the Dark Ages. They viewed this period as a uh, blank between classical antiquity and the beginning of modern Europe. This negative assessment, a legacy of the humanist scholars of Renaissance Italy, persists today in the uh, retention of the noun Middle Ages and the adjective medieval to describe this era in between and its art. Modern scholars, however, long ago ceased to see the art of medi medieval Europe as unsophisticated or inferior. On the contrary, medieval art produced some of the most innovative and beautiful artworks in world history. Oh, wow, that's awesome. Early medieval art, early medieval circa 500 to 1000. Uh, medieval art in Western Europe was a unique fusion of the classical heritage of Rome's former northwestern provinces, cultures of the non-Roman peoples north of the Alps, and Christianity. Over the centuries, the various population groups merged, and a new order gradually replaced what had been the Roman Empire, resulting eventually in the foundation of today's European nations. Art of the Warrior Lords Art historians do not know the full range of art and architecture the early medieval tr Transalpine peoples produced. What has survived is not truly representative and consists almost exclusively of small status symbols, weapons, and items of personal adornment such as bracelets, pendants, and belt buckles discovered in lavish burials. Earlier scholars who viewed medieval art through a Renaissance lens ignored these minor art because of their small scale, seemingly utilitarian nature and abstract decoration, and because their creators rejected the classical idea that the representation of organic nature should be the focus of artistic endeavor. In their own time, however, people regarded these objects as treasures. They enhanced the prestige of their owners and testified to the nature of those buried with them. In the great Anglo-Saxon epic Beowulf, the hero's comrade cremate, oh, cremate, cremate, I thought it was uh, his name, uh, cremate him and place his ashes in a huge tumulus burial mound overlooking the sea. As an everlasting tribute, they buried rings and, uh, I never know how to say this word, uh, bro brooches, 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 in the barrow. Uh, all of those adornments that brave men uh, had brought out from the hoard after Beowulf died. They bequeathed the gleaming gold treasures of men to the earth. Oh shit, we got Beowulf going on in here. Cool. All right. There's that party outside. There it is. Whenever I stream, there it goes. Okay, so I guess I didn't make a mistake. It was the Sutton Who Ship Burial. The Beowulf Saga also recounts the funeral of the warrior lord. Help me out, guys. Here is... I got. I gotta look it up. I gotta look it up. I don't know. S C Y L. S C Y L D. Pronunciation. Cyclid? Cyclid? Oop, it's on mute. Uh. Oop, shit. Hey guys, it's Abby from. So, all things medieval so. are interesting. How do I say this? S-E-Y-L-D. Oh, thanks. S-E-Y-L-D. I don't think that's how I say it. Sad. I can't hear her. Sad. I can't hear her. I don't understand that. Uh, okay, what do we have here? All things medieval are interesting. Yeah. Hey, Hard Chronic. What's up? Hey. Nice to see you. Cool. 
Yeah, I think that's what they were saying in the beginning of the chapters, that, like, people think of medieval in a negative way, or, like, just, I don't know, dark, you know, dark ages, bad, but, like, there were great works of art and history at the time, so. Cool, cool, cool. Hey, Matthias, what's up? Cyclid. I'm just gonna say Cyclid and just try to say it really fast. So, um, yeah, the Beowulf saga also recounts the funeral of the warrior lord Cyclid, who was laid to rest in a ship set adrift in the North Sea, overflowing with arms and armor and costly adornments. So I think this is the, um, is this the cremation like ceremony thing that they're talking about? In 1939, archaeologists uncovered a treasure laden chip in a burial mound at Sutton Hoo, England. Oh, this is in England? Cool! Although unique, it uh, epitomizes the early medieval tradition of burying great lords with rich furnishings. Among the many precious findings were a gold belt buckle, want, ten silver bowls, Want forty gold coins, want and two silver spoons inscribed, Salos and Paulos, Saint Paul's name in Greek before he had his baptism. The spoons may allude to a conversation to Christianity. Some historians have associated the burial with the East Angli Ang Anglian King Raidwald, five ninety nine to six twenty five, who was baptized. A Christian before his death in 625. Okay. The most extraordinary Sutton Hoo finding was a purse cover, want, decorated with cloisonne pla plaques. Early medieval metal workers produced cloisonne jewelry so, uh, by soldering small metal strips or clo cloisons, French for partitions edge up to a metal background and then filling the compartments with semi-precious stones. Oh, that sounds really nice. Pieces of colored glass or glass paste fired to resemble, resemble sparkling jewels. On the Sutton Who purse cover, four symmetrical arranged groups of cloisonne figures make up the lower row. I have to see what they're talking about. Okay, so 6-2. Oh, cool. This is the purse cover from, can you guys see it? I just wanna make sure you can see it. Oh, it's okay. Yeah, you can. Okay, so, want, want, want. Purse cover from the Sutton Who ship, burial in Suffolk, England, circa 625. Gold, glass, and enamel cloisonne with garnets and emeralds seven and a half inches long. It's at the British Museum in London. Oh my god, I want to see it. One of the many treasures found in a ship beneath a royal burial mound. This purse cover combines abstract interlaced ornamentation with animal figure figures, a hallmark of early medieval art in Western Europe. It's really fucking cool. Now we're getting into it. Now we're getting into some fun stuff. I did like the Byzantine stuff, though. I like the Greek stuff, too. Um, Alright. Okay, okay, let's get- Oop, shit. Let's get back into it. We get in deep, that's right, Brad. Um, okay, so this is the most extraordinary I'm finding there. The Sutton Who Purse covering, uh, covers more. Mm -mm. The end groups consisting of front facing man standing between two profile beasts. Let me see, where's the man standing between two profile beasts? Yeah, yeah, okay, I see the two men. Let me see the two beasts. Um, what did they say? On the Sutton Who Purse cover, four symmetrical arranged groups of cl Closene figures make up the lower row. Okay, so those four figures in the lower row. The end group consisting of front-facing man standing between two profiled beasts. The trio is a pictorial parallel to the epic sagas of the era in which heroes like Beowulf battle and conquer horrific monsters. The two center groups represent eagles attacking ducks. Duck? The convex breaks of the eagles fit against the concave beaks of the ducks. 
Okay. Yeah, I see it. The two figures fit together so snugly that they, uh, hold on, I'm just looking at it again. The two figures fit so snugly that they seem at first to be a single dense abstract design. This is true also of the man-animal motif. Above these figures are three geometric designs. Mm -hmm. The outer ones are purely linear. Okay, no. The central design is an interlaced pattern in which the lines turn into rither withering, withering, withering animal figures. Elaborate inter, interwining, intertwining patterns are characteristic of many times and places, but the combination of interlace with animal figures was uncommon outside of the realm of early medieval warlords. Warlords! What? Okay, let's see what we're at here. What happened? What happened? I don't see a pop-up anymore. What happened? Oh, we got a subscriber. Cool. Welcome, Jonathan. Uh, yeah, cool. Welcome him, everybody. Let me see what you guys are saying. Uh, that's a cool artifact. It reminds me of the Covenant Ark from the Indiana Jones film. <laughs> yeah, it, it, that looks really beautiful. I like it. Uh, yeah, so what are, what are they saying? Uh, so there's this elaborate intertwining patterns are characteristic of many times and places. Of many times and places. But the combination of interlace with animal figures was uncommon outside the realm of the early medieval warlords. Cool. So intertwining figures and patterns is a warlord thing. In fact, metalcraft, with the vocabulary of interlaced patterns and other motifs beautifully integrated with animal forms, was the premier art of the early Middle Ages in Western Europe. <laughs> yes, Eduardo says, welcome guy who just subscribed. This is a great community. I think so as well. Thank you. I could get that tat on my arm. Yeah, it's pretty dope. Pretty dope. Okay, let me look at this map real quick, what we're dealing with. I don't know if they're going to talk about this, but okay. So, principal pilgrimage routes to Santiago de Campostela. I don't really know what that means, but... Holy Roman Empire. Love that. It's my jams. The Holy Roman Empire. Kingdom of France. Kingdom. Uh, Norman Kingdom. Kingdom of Leon and Cast Castile. Umayyad Caliphate. Yeah, so that's where the Muslims, there was a Islamic area of Spain there. The uh, Umayyad Caliphate. Surprised to know that they settled in Spain. We went over that last time. Kingdom of Poland, Kingdom of Hungary, Norman Kingdom. Hmm, interesting. Alright. Hiberno Saxon art. Ooh, that looks cool. The Christianization of the British Isles began in the 5th century. Um, yeah, Luke Carson said that they invaded Spain and occupied it for 600 years. World domination. Yeah. Yeah, we went over the Islamic art last time, I believe, and uh, yeah, I was surprised to learn that they occupied Spain for quite a bit, and they moved there, and it was all about their, like, creation and then like expansion and conquering um just like the coming just slaughtering and conquering it was crazy but anyway the hiberno saxon art <clears throat> the christianization of the british isles began in the fifth century the new converts quickly founded monasteries throughout ireland and in britain and scotland in 563 for example saint uh, columba established an important monastery on the Scottish island of Iona. Oh my god, we have like an Iona college or something. It's like Iona, New York or something? I don't know. Uh, where he successfully converted the native Pic 
Picts? Picts. To Christianity. I own a monk's built a monastery at Lindis, Lindisfarne off the northern coast of Britain in 635. These and other later foundations became great centers of learning. Fun! Art historians call the art that flourished within the monasteries of the British Isles Hiberno-Saxon, uh, Irish, English. Hiberno-Saxon? Oh, Hiberno. I didn't know that was like an Irish thing. Cool. But you see, again, this is like examples of every great civilization that thrived or whatever and like the correlation with the church and stuff with with art, all those things with art. Um, and I don't see the church really giving a shit about art lately at all. I don't see, you know, great movements that want great Western civilizations to care about art at all right now. All right, I might turn off the air conditioner now, actually. Hi, Steven is who? Ah, uh, the most important extant Hiberno Saxon artwork are the illuminated manuscripts of the Christian church. Damn, that air conditioner actually muffles this party that's going on out there at this bar. Can you hear that music? I feel like the air conditioner helped. One of my best friends is a devout Catholic and he works with paintings and drawings. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, but the establishment of the church is what I'm at. But yeah, yeah, I hear you. Can you guys hear that music? Should I put the air conditioner back on? It's so distracting, I can't read. Okay, it's too distracting. Extent. Extent. Oh, I didn't notice the T in there. Is that what it is? Uh, extent, yeah. Extent. Still in existence. Surviving. Okay, it's an adjective. The most important extant Hiberno-Saxon artworks. Okay, so the most uh, important still existing, still sur surviving Irish, English artworks are the illuminated manuscripts of the Christian church. Lit liturgical, I hate that, saying that word, uh, books were the primary vehicles in the efforts to Christianize the British Isles. They literally brought the world, uh, the word of God to the predominantly illiterate populace who regarded the monks sum sumptuous volumes with awe. Books were scarce and jealously guarded treasures of the libraries. Love. They are treasures. Books are great. Um, so yeah, they books were scarce and jealously guarded treasures of the libraries. Script scriptoria. Ooh, I love that. Scripting studios. Scriptoria. I'm gonna write that down. Script and churches of early medieval monasteries. Okay. One of the most characteristic features of Hiberno-Saxon book uh, illumination is the inclusion of full pages devoted neither to text nor illustration, but to pure embellishment. Ooh. Interspersed between the text pages are so-called carpet pages, resembling textiles made up of decorative panels of abstract and zoomorphic forms. Many books also contain pages on which the painter 
enormously enlarged the initial letters of an important passage of a sacred text and transformed them into elaborate decorative patterns. I love that. This type of manuscript decoration merged the abstraction of early medieval per personal adornments with the pictorial tradition of early Christian art. Ooh, I love that. So cool. This pattern is just like really pretty too. Let's make it into a dress. Oh my god, see, I'm working on something with someone actually, and I might as well screen cap this and work on some fashions with him. Cool. Love it. Hmm, I'm just thinking of looking at this as a piece of fabric, what I would do with it. Really cool. Really, really cool. Matthias says, we had something similar happen in 1806, 1807. Some English troops tried to invade Argentina, and the people kicked them out by dropping boiling water on them. Oh, my God. Religious art is surviving because of individual artists. The church isn't producing art anymore as an institution. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so this cross and carpet page, uh, oh, I guess they're going to get into it now, but I guess it's just a little briefer. The cross and carpet page, folio page 26, verse of the Lindisfarne Gospels from Northumbria, England. These fucking names in England, I swear to God, there's like... Hertfordshire, Hertfordshireville, I don't know, continues on, town, Hertfordshireville or town, this is tempera on uh, vellum, vellum, one foot, one and a half inches by nine and one fourth inch, and it's in the British Library in London, cool, cool. The marriage between Christian imagery and the animal interlaced style of the early medieval warrior lords can be seen in this full page painting in one of the oldest known Hiberno Saxon gospel books. Cool. So. The. Lindisfarne Gospels. The marriage between Christian imagery and the animal interlaced style of the northern warlords is on display in the Lindisfarne... Did I read this already? No, I didn't. In the... In the Lindisfarne Gospels. The Gospels Good News, the opening four books of the New Testament, tell the story of the life of Christ, but the painter of the Lindisfarne Gospels had little interest in narrative. A cross-inscribed carpet <clears throat> is typical of this lavish book. Fantastic serpentine animals devour each other, curling over and returning on their intertwined, writhing, elastic shapes. The rhythm of expanding and contracting forms produces a vivid effect of motion and change, but the painter held in... Um, held it in check by the regularity of the design and by uh, by the dominating motif of the inscribed cross. The cross, the all-important symbol of the imported religion, stabilizes the rhythm of the serpentines and perhaps by contrast with its heavy immo immobility seems to heighten the effect of motion. Okay talking all artsy and shit. The illuminator placed the motif in detail, uh, detailed symmetries with inversions, reversals, and repetitions that must be studied closely to appreciate not so much their variety as their maze-like complexity. The zoomorphic forms intermingle with clusters and knots of line, and the whole design vibrates with energy. Aww. 
The color is rich yet cool. The painter adroitly adjusted shape and color to achieve a smooth and perfectly even surface. Okay. Well then. Yeah, I, I really do like it. I want to make like a dress out of it or something. That is stunning. That is stunning. Wow. Chiro Yoda page, folio 34, so page 34, recto of the Book of Kells from Iona, Scotland, late 8th or early 9th century. Tempe uh, tempera on vel velum. velum. One foot, one inch by nine and a half inches. Trinity College Library in Dublin. Cool. That is just gorge. That's also going to be a dress. Just saying. Just saying. In this opening page to the Gospel of St. Matthew, the Illuminator transformed the Bib biblical text into abstract pattern, literally making God's words beautiful. <gasps> Uniting the truth with the beautiful, that's what Lady Alchemy does. The design recalls early medieval metalwork. I love this. This is like the Mutus Leaper. Cool. Book of Kells. The greatest achievement of Hiberno-Saxon art is the Book of Kells. You said that about the last thing which boasts an unprecedented number of full-page illuminations, including carpet pages, New Testament figures, and narrative scenes, and mo um, monumentalized and embellished words from the Bible. One medieval commentator described the book in the an, 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 annals? <laughs> annals of Ulster for the year 1003 as the chief relic of the Western world. From an early date, it was housed in an elaborate metalwork box on a church altar, befitting a greatly revered relic. The page reproduced here opens the account of the Nativity of Jesus and the Gospel of St. Matthew. The initial letters of Christ in Greek, the XPI, the Chiro Yoda, the, uh, the cross with the P in it, that symbol of early Christianity, which is why I say the X in Christmas is not taking out Christ. It's actually another symbol for Christ. Occupy, anyway, so the initial letters of Christ in Greek, that thing, um, occupy nearly the entire page. Ooh, let me look at it again. Although two words, autumn, autumn, abbreviated simply as H and gen, gen, genera, generatio, generatio, appear at the lower right. Okay, let's look at this again. Cool. It's really beautiful. I'm going to zoom in. Together they read, now this is how the birth of Christ came about. The page corresponds to the opening of Matthew's Gospel. The page reads in church on Christmas Day. The illuminator transformed the holy words into abstract pattern, literally making God's words beautiful. <gasps> Love that! Totally late alchemy! The intricate design recalls early medieval metalwork, but the Poissonet-like interlace is not pure abstraction. The letter Rho, for example, ends in a male head, and animals are at its base to the left of H. Generatio. <clears throat> half of the figure, half wing, figures of wings, angels appear to the left of Chi, accompanying the monogram as if accompanying Christ himself. Close observation reveals, met, reveals many other figures, humans, and animals. Okay. I mean, I wish I had it in better resolution, honestly. I can't really tell what's going on, but it looks pretty. I don't really see animals. Mm -hmm. 
How are you guys doing, by the way? Let me just check in on you. Um, <clears throat> not very talkative, but, um, okay, okay. Well, just a reminder, guys, I'm gonna shield a little bit. If you want to help contribute to the stream, you can always help me out and help me reach my goal. I need, like, 300 bucks by next week, so that would really help. You can always do that by going to streamlabs.com slash machine code TV. Thank you. We're listening. Okay, okay. I'll get back to it then. <clears throat> we have Carolin Carolingian? Carol Carolingian art. That's what I'm saying. That's what I'm calling it. On Christmas Day of the year 800 in St. Peter's, Pope Leo III, roughly 795 to 816, crowned Charles the Great... Charlemagne, king of the Franks since 768 as emperor of Rome, 800 to 814. Cool. <clears throat> In time, Charlemagne, I love Charlemagne, he's fucking awesome. In time, Charlemagne became known as the first holy, that is, Christian Roman emperor, a title his successor in the West did not formally adopt until the 12th century. Born in 742, when Northern Europe was still in chaos, Charlemagne um, consolidated the Frankish kingdom his father and grandfather bequeathed him and defeated the Lombards in Italy. He thus united Europe and laid claim to reviving the glory of the ancient Roman Empire. His official seal bore the words Renovatio Imperi Romani, Renewal of the Roman Empire. That is so awesome. Charlemagne gave his name, uh, Carolus Magnus in Latin, to an entire era, the Carolingian peri period. <clears throat> that is so awesome. Charlemagne was a sincere admirer of learning. Yeah, this is what I know about him. He definitely was religious. He was, like, devout, I think. Uh, he uh, went to Mass, like, four days a week and um, was all about learning and created like a ton of schools and actually did a lot of good in Europe during the Middle Ages, medieval time. So Charlemagne, anyway, Charlemagne was a seer admirer of learning, the arts and classical culture. See, all great periods of history always have an appreciation of art and culture and learning. Um, anyway. Charlemagne's grandfather was the one that stopped the Moors from invading France. Full circle. Wow. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah, Charlemagne is dope. Okay, what do we have here? Yeah. Charlemagne was a sincere, sincere admirer of learning the arts and classical culture. As one is when you have a great civilization. He invited to his court the best minds of his age. That sounds fantastic. Among them... Um, Alcuin? I don't know that. Master of the Cathedral, Bishop's Church, school at York, the center of Northumbrian learning. One of Charlemagne's dearest projects was the recovery of the true text of the Bible, which, through centuries of errors and copying, had become quite corrupt. Alcuin of York's revision of the Bible became the most widely used. Charlemagne himself could read and speak Latin fluently, in addition to Frankish, his native tongue. He also could understand Greek and held books, both sacred and secular, in especially high esteem, importing many and sponsoring the production of far more. I mean, that is awesome. This guy is doing far more than any East Leb or Pundit or anything, man. He is sponsoring books and education and art culture and was into had different languages and stuff cool okay so then we have coronation gospels the most famous of charlemagne's books is the coronation gospels the text is in handsome gold letters on purple vellum Ooh, that sounds nice golden purple golden purple sweet bread do it do it thank you 
The text is in handsome gold letters on purple vellum. Want it? Want wants. The major full page illustrations illuminations show the four gospel authors at work: Saints Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. The four evangelists, from the Greek word for the one who announces good news. Ooh. The page, figure six five, depicting Saint Matthew, follows the venerable tradition of author portraits, which were familiar features of Greek and Latin books. Let's check it out for a second. Six five. Six five. Oh, okay, we did this. We got Saint Matthew, page fifteen, recto of the Coronation Gospels, Gospel uh, Book of Charlemagne from A Aachen, Germany, eight hundred to eight ten. Ink and tempera on vellum, one feet and three quarters inches by ten inches. San Chats Kamer Kunz. It's a mu in a museum in Vienna. It's in a museum in Vienna. Whew. That looks really nice. Okay, we're going to talk about that one for a second. So that one was depicting St. Matthew follows the venerable tradition of author portraits, which were familiar features of Greek and Latin books. Similar representations of seated philosophers or poets writing or reading abound in ancient art. Ooh, I love that. I'm going to write that down. Uh, hold on. Let me just write that down. That's kind of cool. It's like it's selfies, man. Uh, so similar representations of seated. So let's see. Representations. Representations of seated philosophers or poets writing or reading abound in ancient art. Okay. Ah, you missed these art history streams. Thanks, Matias. Sorry, I'm done with it in a hot minute, huh? Okay, okay, okay. I get the hint. Just sometimes I want to work on art, and I just really want to chill and work on art and just Photoshop or something. And I just figure, fuck it, why don't I just do it as a stream instead of just wasting hours. <laughs> <clears throat> All right, what are we going through here? So, yeah, similar representations of seated philosophers or poets writing or reading abound in ancient art. The Matthew of the... Coronation Gospels also reveals the legacy of classical art. Deft, illusionistic brushwork defines the massive drapery folds wrapped around the body beneath. The Carolingian painter used color and modulation of light and shade to create the illusion of three-dimensional form. Hmm, let me look at that again. on the left there. The cross-legged chair, the lectern, and the saint's toga are familiar Roman accessories, and the placement of the book and lectern top at an angle suggests a Mediterranean model employing classical perspective. The landscape background is also a classical feature, and the frame consists of the kind of acanthus leaves commonly found in Roman art. Almost nothing is known in the Hippo, Saxon, British Isles, or Frankish Europe that could have prepared the way for this portrayal of St. Matthew. If a Frank rather than an Italian or Byzantine painted the St. Matthew and other evangelist portraits of the Coronation Gospels, the Carolingian artist had fully absorbed the classical manner. Classical painting style was one of the many components of Charlemagne's program to establish himself as the head of a renewed Christian Roman Empire. So, they were being really Roman about it. They were really trying to get back to the Roman roots, because he's like, what, the first, like, uh, what was it? This became like Holy Roman Emperor for the first one in the Middle Ages there. 
so they were like taking that shit back to Rome. Cool. <clears throat> and then we have the Lindell Lind Gospels. The taste for luxurious, portable objects known previously in the art of the early medieval uh, warrior lords persisted under Charlemagne and his successors. They commissioned numerous works employing costly materials, including book covers made of gold and jewels, and sometimes also ivory or pearls. <gasps> Want? Gold and gems not only glorify the word of God, but also evoked the heavenly Jerusalem. One of the most sumptuous, sumptuous guys, okay? One of the most sumptuous Carolingian book covers. Um, figure 6-1. Wait, which one was that? 6-1? No, that's the map. That's the map. is uh, the one later added to the Leno Gospels. The gold cover fashioned in one of the... Oh, I know which one it is. That's, that's what we're talking about right now. Sumptuous, that's right, Brad. Yeah, this is what we're talking about here. Want, 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 I want that, guys. I want it. So when I read, I have to figure out how to put things up at the same time as I... Oop. Maybe I'll do this. Boom. All right, we're going with this. Let me make it bigger for you. Did that help or not help? All right. So this is crucifixion. Front cover of the Lindau Gospels from St. Gall, Switzerland, uh, circa 870. It's gold, precious stones, and pearls. <gasps> Ooh, I love it. That's how I'm going to make my Lady Alchemy book covers. That's going to be my Lady Alchemy book cover right there. I'm going to have that same pose, too. I'm going to have a T pose. And it's going to be like, oh, Lady Alchemy is going to have all the other characters in this box. It's going to be like stones, gold, and shit. Um, very sumptuous. Very, very sumptuous. Um, so, this is the front cover of the Lindau Gospels from St. Gall, Switzerland. Circa 870 gold, precious stones, and pearls. It's one foot, one and three eighths inches by ten and three eighths inches. It's at the Pierpont Morgan Library in New York. <gasps> I can see this one, and I know the Pierpont Morgan Library. Pierpont Morgan, I like saying it. It's uptown a bit. Pierpont Morgan. Exactly, doing the uh sound while ascending. Yeah, exactly. Uh, sacred books with covers of gold and jewels were among the most costly and revered art, o revered art objects produced in medieval Europe. This Carolingian cover revives the early Christian imagery of the youthful Christ. Uh, yeah. Angels and shit. Yeah, I got archangels on my comic book. That's it. Got it. 
with little figures reaching up, so I'm... Oh, no, you guys can't see it. I'm trying to zoom in, and I realize you're not on the same thing as I am. Let me try to zoom in this way. Look at these little guys. Oh, we can do that, can we? Look at these little guys. Uh, that is my shit right there. <laughs> Ascension cancelled by a car engine. I saw Mexican in SoCal with that on his rims once. <laughs> He looks like he tripped and dropped his spaghetti. Yeah, I'm sure we're gonna learn all about what these little figures are. So, let's get to it. Let's go back to where I was. Hold on a second, guys. Okay, the Lindau Gospels. The taste for luxurious... Oh, I think I read that already. Uh... I'm going to read it again. The taste for luxurious portable objects shown previously in the art of the early medieval warrior lords persisted under Charlemagne and his successors. They commissioned numerous works employing costly materials, including book covers made of gold and jeweled and sometimes also ivory or pearls. Want, gold and gems not only glorified the word of God, that's right, but also evoked the heavenly Jerusalem. One of the most sumptuous Okay, guys. Sumptuous Carolingian book covers is the one later added to the Lindau Gospels. The gold cover, fashioned in one of the royal workshops of Charles the Bald, Bald, uh, 840 to 875. Charlemagne's grandson uh, presents a youthful Christ in the early Christian tradition, nailed to the cross but uh, oblivious to pain. Surrounding Christ are pearls and jewels ra uh, raised on gold claw feet so that they can catch and reflect the light um, even more brilliantly and protect the delicate metal relief from denting. Oh, let me see. Let me see. Oh, those claws are quite lovely. You see the claws around the gemstones? I believe that's what we're talking about. Very nice. Let me see what they say. <clears throat> Surrounding Christ are pearls and jewels raised on golden claw feet so that they can catch and reflect the light even more brilliantly and protect the delicate metal relief from denting. Hmm. The statuesque eye-opened figures rendered in hammered relief, ooh, a relief, is classical both in conception and execution. In contrast, the four angels and the personification of the moon and sun above the crouching figures of the Virgin Mary and Saint John. Okay, those are the two crouching figures. And two other figures of uncertain identity in the quadrants below display the vibrancy and nervous energy uh, of the Ebo Gospels. Matthew? Wait, am I in the right area? Hold on. Yeah. Energy. This eclectic work highlights the stylistic diversity of early medieval art in Europe. Here, however, the translated figural style of the Mid Mediterranean prevails in keeping with the classical taste and imperial aspirations of the Frankish. Am I, am I reading the right section? What is happening here? I feel like that was like supposed to be to something else. Let me bring you back to where I'm at. Hold up, hold up. to where I am. So I'm like here at the bottom of this page. 
So it says, in contrast, the four angels and the personification of the moon and sun above the crouching figures of the Virgin Mary and St. John and two other figures of uncertain identity in the quadrants below display the vibrancy and nervous energy. And then you go to the next page of the Evo Gospels, Matthew. This eclectic work highlights the stylistic diversity of early medieval art in Europe. Here, however, the translated figural style of the uh, Mediterranean prevails in keeping with the classical taste and imperial aspiration of the Frankish emperors of Rome. Emperors of Rome. Okay, whatever. So then we have, how do I say this? Pronouncenames.com Aachen. 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 Do I really have to say it like that? Aachen? Okay. Can I just say like Aachen or something? Aachen? Aachen. Um. Aachen. In his eagerness, oh, I wanted to smoke. Hold on, give me a second. I just wanted to light this up. I, just, I forgot. I wanted to do this. We can. Let me just like have a look at that other thing while we smoke. There we go. I'm just gonna put that up there for a second. I'm just going to keep saying that now. No gushers, though. Not today. Wait, did we read about this guy? Oh, no, we didn't read about that guy. Okay, yes, yeah, so the, that's what this is about. Okay. <coughs> so this figure 6-6, six, 6-6, six, 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 this eclectic work highlights the stylistic diversity of early medieval art in Europe. Here, however, the translated figural style of the Mediterranean prevails in keeping with the classical tastes and imperial aspirations of the Frankish emperors of Rome. Okay. So they're comparing these two types. So this is St. Matthew, page 18. Uh, the Ebo Gospels, Gospel Book of Archbishop Ebo of Reims, from Hautvillers near Reims, France, circa 816 to 835. It's ink and tempera on vellum, 10 and 1 fourth inches by 8 and 3 fourths inches, and it's in the Bibliothèque Municipale in Epernay. Okay. Uh, St. Matthew writes in frantic haste and the folds of his drapery writh and vibrate. This Carolingian painter merged classical illusionism with the northern linear tradition. Very nice. Okay. Okay, 
Aachen. Let's get back to it. In his eagerness to reestablish the imperial past, Charlemagne, so remember, he's trying to reinvent this, like, glory of Rome. The Holy Roman Empire is the start of this, so... In his eagerness to reestablish the imperial past, Charlemagne looked to Rome and Ravana for models for his buildings. One was the former heart of the Roman Empire, which he wanted to renew. The other was the western outpost of Byzantine might and splendor, which he wanted to emulate in his own capital at Aachen, Germany. Charlemagne often visited Ravana and once brought from their porphyry columns to adorn his um, Palatine Palace Chapel. The plan, um, figure six, seven, of the Aachen Chapel resembles that of Ravana's San, San Vitale, and a uh, direct relationship very likely exists between the two. Okay, so if you remember the San Vitale, I'm sure you guys do, but um, this is the restored plan of the Palatine Chapel of Charlemagne, Aachen, Germany, 792 to 805. Charlemagne often visited Ravana and sought to emulate Byzantine splendor in the north. The plan of his German palace chapel is based on the San Vitale, but the Carolingian plan is simpler. Okay. I think that's what it looks like, right? Really cool. Oh, no! Uh, a comparison between the Carolingian chapel, uh, the first vaulted structure of the medieval, of the Middle Ages north of the Alps, and its southern counterpart is in, uh, instructive, in instructive, instructive. Sorry, I'm a little stoned now. The Aachen plan is simpler. Omitted were San Vitale's aspen-like extensions, reaching from the central octagon into the ambulatory. At Aachen, the two main units stand in greater independence of each other. This solution may lack the subtle sophistication of the Byzantine building, but the Palatine Chapel gains geometric clarity. A view of its interior shows that the architect converted the floating quality of the San Vitale into massive geometric forms. So, I think it looks quite lovely. Quite lovely. I will never forget, though, the fact that these churches and stuff were built to emulate the old Greek and Roman style shopping malls. That's what the architecture is similar to. It's insane. <laughs> these were old shopping mall designs. If you remember the land, the way that they had that that floor plan and the way and, the, and all the different levels and the Claire story windows and shit. Um, what are you guys talking about? Cannab cannabis? <laughs> I notice again. I just sit here and simp on Martina. Oh, stop. All right. So the interior of the Palatine Chapel of Charlemagne, Aachen, Germany, 792 to 805. <clears throat> Charlemagne's chapel is the first vaulted structure of the Middle Ages, north of the Alps. The architect transformed the complex interior of San Vitale into a simpler and massive geometric form. Hmm. Okay. Um... On the interior, two cylindrical towers with spiral staircases. Let me, as I'm reading this, have a picture for you guys to look at, because, sorry, it's kind of annoying. Well, I think it's worth it to pull it up for you guys.
On the interior, two cylindrical towers with spiral staircases flank the entrance portal. Ooh, I like to call an entrance a portal. Hmm. That's what I'm going to call the entrance to my home. It's going to be a portal. Welcome into this portal. This was a first step towards the great dual tower facades of Western European churches from the 10th century to the present. Above the portal, Charlemagne could appear in a large framing arch and be seen by those gathered in the atrium in front of the chapel. Um, <laughs> portal to the Boomer Realm, yeah, that's right. The plan includes only a part of the atrium. Directly behind that second story arch was Charlemagne's marble throne. From there, he could peer down at the altar and the apse. Charlemagne's imperial gallery followed the model of the Western Imperial Gallery at Hagia Sophia in Constantinople, even if the design of the facade broke sharply from Br Br Byzantine tradition. Um, it's funny. <laughs> Will there be a portal? <laughs> okay, so now we're going to talk about St. Gaul. Let me find the image for you guys to stare at as I talk about that. Let's see, where is it? It's 6-9. 6-9. Six, 6-9. Nine. Six, nine. Where, six, where are you? Oh, there's So St. Gall, the construction exp and expansion of many monasteries also characterized the Carolingian period, about 819. Hato? Hato? Hato. The abbot of Reikenu and bishop of uh, Basel commissioned a schematic plan figure 6-9. This is apparently a schematic plan for an a Benedictine monastic community. Um, oh yeah, it, does, it is a plan, isn't it? Yeah, so this is the schematic plan for a monastery at St. Gall, Switzerland, uh, circa 819. Red ink on parchment, 3 feet eight and one eighth inches by two feet and four inches and wow that name is incredible i do not know how to say it oh no there's bibliotech in there i see it stiff's bibliotech yeah okay saint gall the purpose of this plan for an ideal self-sufficient monastery was to separate the monks from the l lady laity l-a-i-t-y laity uh, lady. Near the center is the church with its cloister and earthly paradise reserved for the monks. <gasps> Fun! How nice is that? I'm into it. See this thing above. Okay. And it sent it to the abbot of St. Gall in Switzerland to use as a guide. So someone took this and sent it, this plan, uh, and took it to St. Gall in Switzerland to use as a guide in rebuilding the monastery there. It uh, constitutes a treasure trove of information about Carolingian uh, monastic life. The design's fundamental purpose was to separate the monks from the laity, non clergy, who also inhabited the community. That's what the lady thing is. Okay, so they were separating the monks from the non-clergy who also inhabited the community. Later monasteries all across Western Europe are variations of the Saint Gall scheme. Hmm. 
Near the center, dominating everything, was the church with its cloister, a colonnaded courtyard, uh, not unlike the early Christian atrium, but situated to the side of the church rather than in front of its main portal. Portal reserved for the monks alone, the cloister, a kind of earthly paradise removed from the world at large, provided the peace and quiet necessary for contemplation. Mm. Clustered around the cloister, clustered around the cloister were the most essential buildings. The dormitory, refectory, kitchen, and storage rooms. Other structures, including an inf infirmary, school, guest house, bakery, brewery, and workshops were grouped around the central core of the church and cloister. Um, cool. Brad Bradfield is like taking notes. It's okay. Uh, we're just, uh, <laughs> this guy's American, but he just learned how to say based or write based in Cyrillic. That's so funny. Oh, thanks, Brad. I'm glad you appreciate it. Um, uh, so, Hato, I'm going to call it that, invited the abbot of St. Gall to adapt the plan as he saw fit, and the St. Gall builders did not, in fact, follow the Raikanu model exla ex exactly. Nonetheless, if the abbot had wished, Hato's plan could have served, served as a practical guide for the St. Gall masons because it was laid out on a module standard unit of two and a half feet parts or multiples of this module appear consistently throughout the plan for example the nave's width indicated on the plan as 40 feet equals 16 modules the length of each monk's bed two and a half modules okay getting all technical there um what is the link to this pdf good question good question um did I share it in, let me share, can I share? Get a link, create a link. Ah, oh, I have to sign in my Adobe, really? Ah, oh, hold on a second, let me do. No, well, I have uh, Adobe. It's just a matter of getting in. Let me see what my passwords are. I never know this shit, but I've written it down in various books, so hold on, let me see. I know I've gotten pissed off and wrote down passwords. Twitter, Instagram, Gmail, Facebook. I'm looking for Adobe, right? God. Come on, passwords. I think I have another book, too. There's another notebook somewhere. I'm gonna have to just try some. Okay. Look at my Lady Alchemy sketches. I drew these the costumes. Work, it doesn't work. Oh. Um, I should get you guys this link for sure. Ah, 
is resetting my password. Fuck. signed in though. All right, I'm getting it. Getting it. Creating link. It's thinking. Maybe I'll roll something while it's thinking. I don't know. taking so long. Just make me a goddamn link for the PDF. What's wrong with you? I'll get back to the education. One second. I'm just rolling now, but, um, okay. Ooh, ooh, got it, got it. Copy link. Got it. All right. How's that? Second, I'm just rolling something now. Doobie. Jay, I don't think anyone talks like that in reality. Doobie. Maybe they do in California. I don't know. Fucking cornballs. So let me get back to it. Sorry about it. So this plan had, you know, stuff for the dormitory, for refectory, kitchen, storage rooms, other structures, including an infirmary, schools, guest house, bakery, brewery. We had a brewery on this monastery. See, Mom? And workshops uh, were grouped around this central core of uh, church and cloisters. So the guy didn't, the builder didn't follow the plans exactly, but 
they followed that whole, like, you know, module shit. Um, the models that carried the greatest authority for Charlemagne and his builders were those from the Christian phase of the Roman Empire. Uh, the widespread adoption of the early Christian basilica at St. Gall and elsewhere, rather than the domed central plan of the Byzantine churches, was crucial to the subsequent development of Western European church architecture. Fortunately, no Carolingian basilicas have, unfortunately, no Carolingian, uh, Carolingian, Lingian, uh, basilicas have survived in anything approaching its original form. Aww. Nevertheless, it is possible to reconstruct the appearance of some of them with fair accuracy. The monastery church at St. Gall, for example, was essentially a traditional basilica, but it had features not found in early Christian church. Um, most obvious is the addition of a second apse on the west end of the building. Not quite as evident, but much more important to the subsequent development of church architecture north of the Alps was the presence of a um, transept at St. Gall, a rare feature, but one that characterized the two greatest early Christian basilicas in Rome, St. Peter's and St. Paul's. The St. Gall transept is as wide as the nave on the plan as probably the same, and was probably the same height. Early Christian builders had not been concerned with proportional relationships. They assembled the various portions of their buildings only in accordance with the, uh, with the dictates of liturgical needs. On the St. Gall plan, however, the various parts of the building re relate to one another by a geometric scheme that ties them together into a tight, cohesive unit. Equalizing the widths of naves and transepts automatically makes the area they were cross, where they cross, the crossing a square. Okay, so there's like a square crossing thing. Uh, most Carolingian, uh, Carolingian churches shared this feature, <clears throat> the crossing area and where it makes a square. Let me see the picture. What are they talking about? I need to look at the picture now. Cross area that makes a square. Um, okay, is that in the middle there or is it like a bigger thing? So most Carolingian, Carolingian, I don't know how what I'm saying now, uh, churches shared this feature, but Hadio's planner also used the crossing square as the unit of measurement for the remainder of the church plan. The transept arms are equal to one crossing square. The distance between transept and apse is one crossing square, and the nave is four and a half crossing squares long. The fact that two aisles are half as wide as the nave integrates all parts of the church into rational, orderly plan. I might be having a stroke, probably. I'm just going to put this out. That's what I'm going to do. Put that out. The St. Gall plan also reveals another important feature of many Caroling Carolingian basilicas, tower framing the ends of the church. Hato's plan shows only two towers, both cylindrical on the west side of the church, as the palace, Char uh, as the palace, as the Palestine, Palestine Chapel, Charlemagne's Chapel at Aachen, but they stand apart from the church facade. If a tower exists above the crossing, the silhouette of St. Gall would have shown three towers, um, altering the horizontal profile of the traditional basilica and identifying the church even from afar. Mm. Other Carolingian basilicas had towers incorporated in the fabric of the west end of the building. As in Charlemagne's um, Palatine, Palatine Chapel, thereby creating a unified monumental facade that greeted all those who entered the church. Architectural historians call this feature of Carolingian art some later uh, churches the Westwork, German Westwork, Western Entrance Structure. Western Entrance Structure, I like the name of that too. So we got a portal and then we have 
the western entrance structure. I like that. All right. So let's go back to these medieval monasteries and a bit Benedictine rule. So monastic foundations appeared in Western Europe beginning in early Christian times. The monks who established monasteries also made the rules that governed them. Cool. The most significant of these monks was Benedict of Ner Nursia, St. Benedict, uh, who founded the Benedictine Order in 529. He sounds like dude. I want an order. By the 9th century, the rule Benedict wrote, Regula Sancti Benedicti, had become standard for all European monasteries establishments, uh, monastic establishments, in part because Charlemagne encouraged its adoption throughout the Frankish territories. Martina's entrance structure. <laughs> I like that, yeah. Um, St. Benedict believed the corruption of the clergy accompanying the increasing worldliness of the Christian church had its roots in the lack of firm organization and regulation. As he saw it, idleness and selfishness had led to neglect of the com commandments of God and of the church. Idleness and neglectfulness, yeah. The cure for this was communal association in an abbey under the absolute rule of an abbot, the monks elected, or an abbess, the nuns, uh, the nuns chose, huh, who would see to it that the monks spent each hour of the day in useful work or sacred reading. The emphasis on work and study and not on meditation and Austerity is of great historical significance. Since antiquity, manual labor had been considered disgraceful, the business of the lowborn of slaves, Benedict raising it to the dignity of religion, by thus exalting the virtue of manual labor. Uh, Benedict not only rescued it from its age-old association with slavery, but also recognized it as the path to self-sufficiency for the entire religious community. Wow. That's really fucking cool. Cool, cool, cool. Whereas some of the some of Saint Benedict's followers emphasize spiritual work over manual labor, others, most notably the sister, oh, I gotta look it up. Sis. Cistercians, Cistercian. Cistercian, okay. Okay, so whereas some of St. Benedict's followers emphasize spiritual work over manual labor, others, most notably the Cistercians, put his teachings about the value of physical work into practice. These monks reached into their surroundings and helped reduce the vast areas of daunting wilderness of early medieval Europe. They cleared dense forest, um, teeming with wolves, bears, and wild boar, drained swamps, cultivated wastelands, and built roads, bridges, and dams, as well as monastic churches and their associated living and service quarters. An ideal monastery um, that this figure that you are staring at as I read this thing provided all the facilities necessary for the conduct conduct of daily life a mill bakery infirmary vegetable garden and even a brewery so that the monks felt no need to wander outside its protective walls I mean I kind of like that <laughs> these religious communities were critically important to the revival of learning the clergy who were also often scribes and scholars had a monopoly on the skills of reading and writing in an age of almost universal illiteracy. That's pretty dope. So they were like super wise, like they could motherfucker read back then, like cool. The monastic libraries and scriptoria, cool, where the monks read, copied, illuminated, and bound books with ornamented, ornamented covers became centers of study. That sounds fucking cool. I don't wanna do that. Dope. Uh, 
Yeah, so the monastic libraries and scriptoria where the monks read, copied, illuminated, bound books with ornamented covers became centers of study. Monasteries were almost the sole reposito uh, repositories of what remained and the literary culture of the Greco-Roman world and early Christianity. St. Benedict's requirements of manual labor and sacred reading came to include writing and copying books, studying music for chanting the day's um, offices, and of great significance, teaching. The monasteries were also schools of the early Middle Ages. Cool. Scriptoria. Yeah, that beats sumptuous. Yeah, scriptoria is cool. I wrote it down because I'm like, that's fucking cool. Um, okay, so now we're getting into uh, Etonian art. So let me just switch over a little bit for you. Read a little bit along with me until we get to an image, and then I'll bring it up for you. So that's what we're doing. Let me clear up my computer tabs. Hold on. Okay. Let me see. Jay, that is fucking vile. What you put in the Discord with. Loomer's butt, that was fucking vile. Um, wow. I just like saw that real quick. Wow, wow, wow. Okay. So, Etonian art. Charlemagne was buried in the Palatine Chapel at Aachen. His empire survived him by fewer than 30 years. Huh. When his son, Louis uh, the Pious, 814 to 840, died, Louis's son, Charles the Bald, Lothair, and Louis the German divided the Carolingian Empire among, them, among themselves. In 843, after bloody conflicts, the brothers signed a treaty partitioning the Frankish lands into western, central, and eastern areas, very roughly foreshadowing the later nations of France and Germany, and a third realm corresponding to a long strip of land stretching from the Netherlands and Belgium to Rome. In the mid-10th century, the eastern part of the former empire consolidated under the rule of a new Saxon line of German emperors called after the names of the three most um, illustrious family members, the Etonians. The Pope crowned the first Otto, 936 to 973, in Rome in 962. The three Ottos not only preserved the enriched, uh, preserved, but enriched the culture and tradition of the Carolingian period. Um, that reminds me. I've shot with a photographer who is, uh, We'll probably get to him at some point. Why do I feel like Otto? Something in Germany. It's like von something. Bismarck. It was Bismarck. Otto von Bismarck, yeah. His uh, great, I don't know, his fucking relative of some sort, uh, Nikolai von Bismarck. Count Nikolai von Bismarck. He's a photographer who's dating like, oh, what's her face? Uh, that's the most famous model from like the 90s and shit. Kate Moss. Seeing Kate Moss. And he shot portraits of me. The Hasselblad one time. It's cool. Um, yeah. Brad, you seem really fun. You should probably be in our Discord. I don't know. I don't know if you're an artist, though. It's an art Discord. It's art people. I mean, you're here. You're in the art history stream, so maybe. Maybe. Also, you guys can get in my Discord if you join my Patreon. So, yeah. Um, yeah, anyway, so where are we at? So, in the mid-10th century, the eastern part of the former empire consolidated under the rule of a new Saxon line of German emperors called, after the names of the most uh, illustrious family members, the Etonians. The Pope crowned the first Otto, 936 to 973, in Rome in 962. The three autos not only preserved, but enriched the culture and tradition of the Carolingian period. Cool. So, yeah. Anyway. Yeah, you can also help support the stream, guys. Definitely need a few hundred bucks by next week. So, I can buy rent. You know. 
to do that by going to streamlabs.com slash more chamber code TV. Oh, okay, so Hildesheim? Hildesheim. That's what I'm saying. That's what I'm calling it. One of the great patrons of Etonian art and architecture was Bishop Bernward of Hildesheim, Germany. So, again, great civilizations, great history, people funding arts. One of the greatest patrons of Etonian art and architecture was this bishop. He's also, you know, part of the church. So, this is pretty constant, you'll see, is, uh, you know, seeing the importance of art and when, whenever really big, important kind of uh, leaders of these nations or, or lands or whatever have you in history, they always appreciate the arts. So, people that don't think it's important, think again. So one of the greatest patrons of Etonian art and architecture was Bishop Bernward of Hildesheim, Germany. He was the tutor of Otto III, 983 to 1002. Wow, that's crazy. It just makes me think of like a thousand years later, 2002. I remember that. Uh, and builder of the Abbey Church of St. Michael, figures 610 and 611 at Hildesheim. So let me see. Do we have 610 and 611? Okay, so let me bring this up for you guys. Ah, oh, CL Hubbard. You're always so sweet. Thank you. I, I really hope that, um, you know, that, that you're able to give and that that's just, like, no big deal and because it really helps me out a lot. Like, wow. Wow, wow. Thank you. Um, I hope it's not much for you, but it's a lot for me. That's all I gotta say. So let's bring up this artwork, this architecture. Yeah. We are talking about <clears throat> the Hildesheim, and it's one of the um, <clears throat> Bishop Bernward of Hildesheim, Germany, builder. He was the tutor of Otto the Third and builder of the Abbey Church of Saint Michael's. Figures six ten and six eleven. So the first and second figures. Um, Bernward, who made Hildesheim a center of learning, was an expert craftsman and bronze caster, as well as a scholar. Oh, that sounds like a lovely dude. In 1001, he traveled to Rome as the guest of Otto III. During this day, Bernward studied at first hand the ancient monuments, um, the Carolingian and Ottonian emperors re revered. So he studied the great uh, monuments that they revered. Constructed between 1001 and 1031 and rebuilt after being bombed during World War II. Holy shit. Bernward St. Michael's uh, is an elaborate version of a Carolingian basilica. It has two apses, two transepts, and multiple towers. The transepts create eastern and western centers of gravity. The nave seems to be merely a hall that connects them. Lateral entrances leading into the aisles from the north and south, figure 611, additionally make for an almost complete loss of the traditional basilican orientation towards the east. Some ancient Roman basilicas, such as the Basilica Ulpia in Trajan's Forum, we've talked about that in the past, also had two apses and entrances on the side. And oop, what the fuck happened? 
My, like, page just, like, flipped and changed. I hope I'm still streaming. We still good? We alright? Okay. Whew, that scared me. It just, like, flipped on me. Oh god, I'm, like, really freaked out now. Uh, what was I saying? So... Some ancient Roman basilicas, such as the Basilica Ulpia in Trajan's Forum, something we've talked about in the past, also had two apses and entrances on the side. Um, and Bernward probably was familiar with this variant basilica plan. Okay, so let's look at this top one over here. Looks like a lovely church. St. Michael's, Hildesheim, Germany, 1001 to 1031. Wow, the fact that that was built, like... Over a thousand years ago, it was crazy. This is some medieval shit. Oh, but it was also rebuilt a bit because it was bombed in World War II, which I feel like I can see the bits that was rebuilt. I feel like I see the old bits there. It's kind of weird, wow. Built by Bishop Bernward, a great art patron. Fantastic, we need more of those. St. Michael's is a masterpiece of Etonian basilica design. The church's two apses, two transepts, and multiple towers give it a distinct profile. Um, yeah, and then the second is the plan there. And you can see what it kind of looks like inside there. <clears throat> longitudinal, longitudinal section um, and plan at the bottom. Let me bring up the bottom the plan is. Hold on a second. Oop. There we go. Looking at it like that now. Longitudinal section top and plan bottom of the Abbey Church of St. Michael's, Hildesheim, Germany, 1001 to 1031. St. Michael's entrances are on the sides. Alternating piers and columns divide the space and the nave into vertical units. These features transform the tunnel-like horizontally of early Christian basilicas. Horizontality. These features transform the tunnel-like horizontality of early Christian basilicas. Okay. Sure thing. All right, what are we talking about now? Let me just make sure we're on schedule. We've been streaming for two hours now. Well, we're almost done, so what we have working on here is we just did the Hildesheim, and then we have the Bernward's Doors and Jarrow Crucifix, so yeah, almost done here, cool. Sumptuous horizontality, baby, that's right, horizontality. Let's take a ride with me in this book and see where we are at. Hold up. Horizontality. So, let's zoom out to 100%. We read all that. Yeah, we read all that. And uh, now we are at the Bernoir doors. So let me pull up this picture of these doors. We'll try to get it in detail. Hopefully the detail comes out. zoom in on that as needed. So these are uh, doors with relief panels. Uh, it's Genesis, left door, life of Christ, right door. It's commissioned by Bishop Bernward for St. Michael's, Hildesheim, Germany, 
uh, 1015. It's made out of bronze. It's 16 feet, 6 inches high, and it's in the Museum Hildesheim. Wow, imagine that being the doors to that, that um, medieval church that we just saw. <laughs> Brad, Brad says, I've learned more in this dream than all of my uh, school art classes combined. Yeah, we learn things here, man. We learn things. It's fun. So, um, Bernward's doors vividly tell the story of original sin and redemption and draws parallels between Old and New Testaments, pairing the expulsion from paradise and the infancy and suffering of Christ. Cool. That could be a door to my house. Yeah, it's the portal, man. It's the portal or the western entrance structure or eastern entrance structure. Uh, yes, Romanesque is next. It's part of this chapter, actually, so we'll see. So Bernward's Doors, in 1001, when Bishop Bernward was in Rome, he resided in Otto III's palace on the Aventine Hill in the neighborhood of Santa Sabina, an early Christian church renowned for its carved wooden doors. Those doors, decorated with episodes from both the Old Testament, uh, may have inspired the remarkable bronze doors the bishop had cast for St. Michael's. The Hildesheim doors, this figure you are looking at, are more than 16 feet tall. Each was cast in a single piece with the figural sculpture, a tech, uh, technological marvel. Carolingian uh, sculpture, like most sculpture since the fall of Rome, consisted primarily of small-scale art executed in ivory and precious metals, often for book covers. Hmm. That's interesting. The Hildesheim doors are huge in comparison, but the 16 individual panels stem from that tradition. Okay, so it's still quite small and, and when you look at the details, I guess is what they're saying. So it's still in tradition. Um, the panels of the left door illustrate highlights from the book of Genesis beginning with the creation of Adam at the top and ending with the murder of Adam and Eve's son Abel by his brother Cain at the bottom okay let's look at this real quick so it's pretty blurry so let me maybe screenshot another image for you guys it still looks blurry on my end too. It's kind of shit. Yeah, it's kind of shit. Alright, well, we'll try. Let's look at this. So, what do we have here? This is uh, Adam and Eve and you know, Cain and Abel? Wait, let's go back. Let me see. The panels of the left door illustrate highlights from the book of Genesis, beginning with the creation of Adam at the top and ending with the murder of Adam and Eve's son, Abel, by his brother, Cain, at the bottom. I mean, I don't really see the creation with Adam and Eve on the left, because there's like three, there's like three beings on the top left. I don't understand. I'm just looking at the left side right now. Oop, there it is, Cain and Abel. And murdering each other and shit. Pretty trad, you know, to kill your brother. Your mom's like Adam and Eve and kill your mother and brother and shit. Fucking fucked up family. Um. <sighs> okay. The right door recounts the life of Christ reading from the bottom up. Okay. Starting with the Annunciation and terminating with the appearance to Mary Magdalene of Christ after the resurrection. Yeah, so if you remember too, there was uh, the chapter when we got into, I think the Byzantine stuff, they had the whole, was it the Byzantine? Where they got into all the like life of Christ stuff. Yeah, it was. And, um, there's different, like, sections that they like to do a lot of times. Some of them were quite surprising and interesting, kind of funny. Bible's crazy, man. 
Bible is crazy. Culture war. Um, okay, so let me see. We are the right doors recount the life of Christ, reading from the bottom up, starting with the Annunciation and terminating with the appearance to Mary Magdalene of Christ after the resurrection. So yeah, he appeared to Mary Magdalene, I guess, after he resurrected. Let's look. So we're going from the bottom. This is the Annunciation. Look at the angel. Nice. Life of Christ. And then stuff happening. Stuff happening. Yep. Ooh, there's the crucifix. Nice, nice. Yeah, that's happened. I see an angel. And I guess he appeared before Mary Magdalene. Cool. <clears throat> Uh, together, the doors tell the story of original sin and ultimate redemption, showing the expulsion from the Garden of Eden and a path back to paradise through the church. Oh, I like that. Wow. So, yeah, it's that duality of, like, the Old Testament in the beginning, Genesis, starting with, like, the expulsion from the uh, Garden of Eden and paradise, and then through Jesus that portal back back to paradise wow very nice very nice um hmm. yeah dude passions is really good mel gibson is really good so um as in early christian times theologians interpreted the old testament as prefiguring the new testament yeah that's right the panel depicting the fall of adam and eve for example is juxtaposed with the crucifixion on the other door so the panel depicting the fall of adam and eve juxtaposed with the crucifixion on the other side wow yeah let me see let's look at that again so that's the part on the left the fall, and then the right, the crucifixion. Interesting. Um, Eve nursing the infant Cain is opposite Mary with the Christ child in her lap. Okay, Eve nursing the infant Cain is opposite Mary with Christ and child. really get it. Which one? Where's Mary? And then, wait, which one? Oh, so this is the Annunciation. Oh, okay, so this is where it is. Okay, so that's what it is. That, that's the baby. Alright, alright. No, that's not the fall. This is the fall, right. And then the two, the women, right? So then there's like, I think this one ended with... Fuck, no. I can't figure it out. Um, <clears throat> Eve nursing the infant Cain is uh, opposite Mary with Christ child in her lap. Christ child, I like that. With Christ child. Baby Jesus. Christ child. Uh, the figures show a vivid um, animation that recalls the St. Matthew of the Evo Gospels, but the narrative compositions also reveal the Hildesheim's artist genu a genius for anecdotal detail. For example, in the fourth panel from the top on the left door. Okay, so the fourth panel from the top on the left door. Okay. One, two, three, four. So this one on the left right here is what we're looking at. I wish we had better images. Maybe I can pull it up on the internet. What is this? This is the, the Hildesheim. Hildesheim. Oh no, I got an easier way. So, Burn Ward's doors. Burn Ward's doors. Oop, no, I'm not gonna shop for it. Oh no, I need Bing.
<clears throat> yeah, it's kind of shit quality, but it's better. So let's see. One, two, three, four. <clears throat> so, one, two, three, four. This one right here we're looking at. So, what are they saying? For example, uh, okay, so... So it shows the artist's genius for anecdotal detail. For example, on the fourth panel from the top on the left door, God, portrayed as a man, accuses Adam and Eve after their fall from grace. He jabs his finger at them with the fourth force of his whole body. Uh, the frightened pair crouch, both to hide their shame and to escape the lightning bolt of divine wrath. Each passes the blame, Adam pointing backward to Eve at two backward to Eve, and Eve pointing to, uh, downward to the deceitful serpent. Both figures struggle to point with one arm while attempting to shield their bodies from sight with the other. With an um, instinct for ex expressive pose and gesture, the artist brilliantly communicated Adam and Eve's newfound embarrassment and their nakedness and their unconvincing denials of wrongdoing. Hmm. Okay, I see it. So he's jabbing his finger at them, and they're both pointing at other things and cowering in shame. Um, yeah. I see it. I see it. Do you guys see it? Do you see them cowering in shame? Okay, so now we're going to do the Jero Crucifix. Let's find that. 613. Let me get a picture of it for you guys. Oop! Wrong button. Jesus or something. Looks like he even has cornrows. Looks like a gangster there. Okay, so we have... The Jero Crucifix. Nowhere is the Atonian revival of interest in monumental sculpture more evident than in the Crucifix. Archbishop Jero commissioned and presented to... Uh, Column uh, Cathedral in 970. I I think that's in, in I don't I never know how to say that name. Column Column. It's like Cologne. Column. <laughs> we was gangs. Black Jesus. Um. Yeah. So what is it? In 970. Okay. Carved in oak and then painted and gilded, the six-foot-tall image of Christ nailed to the cross presents a dramatically different conception of the Savior than seen on the Lin Lindo Gospels cover, with its early Christian imagery of a youthful Christ triumphant over death. The bearded Christ of the Column Crucifix is more akin to Byzantine representations of the suffering Jesus, but the emotional power of the Etonian work is greater still. The sculptor depicted Christ as an all-too-human martyr. Streaks of blood trickle down his forehead from the missing crown of thorns. His eyelids are closed and his face is contorted in pain. Christ's body sags. Oh yeah, so what they were saying is like different from the other cover that we saw that was like totally bedazzled and all those jewels. I was like, oh my god, I want it. If you remember, they were talking about how Christ was like T-posing and he was like painless. He was just like, oh, I do this for you, you know, just like, oh. This one is him being in pain. So that's like what they're talking about with that. Yeah. Um, so his eyelids are closed and his face contorted in pain. Christ's body sags under its own weight. The muscles stretch to their limits. Those of his right shoulder um, and chest seem almost too 
rip apart. Ew, gross. The halo behind Christ's head. Oh, I'm looking at it now. Very nice. Uh, may foretell his subsequent resurrection, but the worshiper can sense only his pain. Jero's crucifix is the most powerful characteri characterization of intense agony of the early Middle Ages. Cool. All right. Well, guys, we have completed that section, and the next art history stream will be about Romanesque art. Let me just give you a little preview real quick. It has been over two hours, and we have completed what I was going for. So next is the Romanesque art, France, uh, pilgrimage, pil pilgrimage, pilgrimages, oh, pilgrimage. I can't say it now. Uh, and cults of relics. Uh, I'm kind of into the cult of relics, so that's pretty cool. Uh, cool, awesome awesome stuff. Look at that art. Look at that. Look at that architecture. <gasps> so exciting. So exciting. We got some medieval Romanesque. Look at that. Look at the drama. Look at the drama in this. So cool. Can't wait to learn about all that. Awesome. Awesome medieval inking or painting. Holy Roman Empire and Italy. Normandy and England. I mean, look, so cool. <gasps> Beautiful. Awesome. So, yeah, that's what we have to look forward to next time. We're going to go over the Romanesque. And, uh, yeah, that'll be probably like tomorrow. I gotta, I gotta stream. As long as you guys are cool and you're down for it, I'm not overdoing it, you think. I'll do it tomorrow. When are we going to learn about Nubian space Muslim art? We can do that. Maybe we'll do that while I'm away and I don't have my computer and I'm on my phone. So, yeah. Ah, uh, thanks, Brad. I hope that was... I think you enjoyed yourself. I enjoyed myself. We have a really fun crew in here, and everyone's super just like awesome and intelligent. We all learn something and share something with each other, and it's really, really great. I really appreciate you guys. Uh, yeah, I mean, just join us regularly. Like, subscribe, you know, hit that bell thingy so that it like notifies you when we're live. Cause we like every stream is pretty fun. I think it was chill. So, um, uh, See you guys tomorrow. Maybe we'll go over this Romanesque art.